These slides were created by James E. Mazur to accompany the eighth edition of Mazur Learning and Behavior 2017. They were adapted by me, Liz Kayanka, in 2020 for Cal State East Bay's Psychology 310 Conditioning and Learning. Chapter 1, Part 1, The Search for General Principles of Learning. What is learning? In this class and in your textbook, learning doesn't just refer to the learning that happens in the classroom, and it's not just about the learning that humans do. Mazur's definition of learning as a change in behavior that results from experience is adapted from a preliminary definition offered in 1961 by another behavioral psychologist, Gregory Kimball. His definition was a relatively permanent change in behavioral potentiality that occurs as a result of reinforced practice. I want to go over each of the terms in bold uh, to elaborate a little bit. By relatively permanent, Kimball meant that the change in behavior was neither transitory, so happening and then going away, nor fixed. Uh, which means that forgetting does occur and that behavior that has is a result of learning can be modified by events in the future. By behavioral potentiality, Kimball acknowledges that there is potential to behave differently even if the behavior is not occurring immediately. In other words, learning occurs when the potential for behavior change happens, not when you actually observe a different behavior. By reinforced practice, Kimball is using a higher bar than experience. For Kimball, learning required reinforcement. In the 20th century, there was a great debate over whether this was the case. One more thing about learning in this class and this textbook is that it covers both the process and the product of learning. So both uh, the acquisition or change in behavior and the stable pattern of learned behavior. There are many general scientific principles. One of the most uh, well known is a general principle from physics, the law of gravity. The law of gravity predicts the distance of a freely falling object in a given amount of time. Now, there are some caveats to this law. Uh, the object has to be stationary to begin with. It has to be relatively close to Earth, otherwise it, gravity won't bring it towards the Earth. It'll send it somewhere else. And the, the distance that the object falls is also impacted by other forces, for example, air resistance. Experimental physicists who study gra gravity do so in a laboratory so they can establish experimental control. For example, a vacuum chamber, they use a vacuum chamber so there's no air resistance. They maintain the lab at a known constant temperature. This makes it possible to have simpler, more sterile conditions, and those conditions make it easier to manipulate independent variables and see their effects on dependent variables. Now, just like experimental physicists you use vacuum chambers and the like, uh, experimental psychologists use simple, simplified circumstances in their laboratories, and they do so for the same reason, experimental control. In the 1930s, B.F. Skinner developed a specific apparatus and system for studying conditioning and learning with a high degree of experimental control. Uh, this is sometimes called a Skinner box. And the one on screen now is, uh, I think, one from Jim Mazur's own laboratory. And you can see there's a rat, the subject. There are a couple of levers, one on either side, and then one in the middle of the main wall. There are lights that can be used as stimuli. There's a food hopper, which is a little apparatus 
where uh, food can be delivered uh, depending on certain events and based on the way the experiment is programmed. What do you think of this apparatus? In the textbook, Mazur called it sparse, but it's been used widely in behavioral science. I'll leave it to you to judge for yourself whether that wide use has been effective and productive at the end of the semester.